The murder of Elizabeth Short, in 1947, infamously known as the case of the Black Dahlia, has fascinated people for over 75 years, as it remains officially unsolved. This video was made with the assumption that you, the viewer, have a general knowledge of the crime. If you are unaware of Elizabeth Short and the Black Dahlia case, I would suggest getting yourself acquainted before continuing with this video. With dozens of suspects, many people today have their favored individual. Someone they suspect most. But in order to properly evaluate a suspect, it is necessary to know the person as best as possible. I felt it important to examine many of the potential suspects in this case and in doing so, I found things concerning one suspect that I have not seen discovered anywhere. Findings which make the suspect deserving of a deeper look. The 1951 suspect list by Lt. Frank B. Jemison lists Dr. Patrick S. O'Reilly as suspect number 21 of 22. He is listed due to his reported friendship with fellow suspect Mark Hansen, for having spent time at the Florentine Gardens, and for having attended sex parties in Malibu, in addition to attacking his secretary in the past, and for being a surgeon who had his right breast removed by surgery, similar to how the killer removed Elizabeth Short's right breast. When I looked into the life of Dr. O'Reilly, I quickly found myself a bit perplexed. Digging through newspapers, census reports, and voter rolls, I could not find any conclusive evidence that this individual existed before a 1924 voter registration, which was decades after his birth. You won't find Dr. O'Reilly's birth certificate. You will not find O'Reilly on any census in his youth. You will discover nothing. And there is a reason for this. Before 1917, Patrick O'Reilly simply did not exist. Going down a rabbit hole of records, I found a hidden life full of mystique and outright fabrications, a life with numerous plot twists. While I think that a deeper dive into this little-known suspect reveals many more reasons to wonder if he could have been the killer, if anything you will see that Dr. Patrick Shane O'Reilly was much more than the police were aware of at the time. Rather than going back through the tangled web as I had to do, I will start at Dr. O'Reilly's true beginnings. First, I introduce you to Peter Domingo Traer, a storekeeper at the prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. Peter, and his wife Albertina, had three children, two daughters, Mary and Francis, and one son, Patrick, who was born March 17, 1900. This Patrick, from Kansas, was in fact, the individual we now know as Dr. O'Reilly. While there are quite a few newspaper articles concerning Patrick Traer's early life, I would like to jump ahead to when he was 16, in 1916. Patrick supposedly tried and failed to join the U.S. Army. His father, Peter, a military veteran, wouldn't allow his only son to get roped into the horrors of war at such a young age. Aiming his sights at the Kansas National Guard, Patrick devised a plan. Running away from home, he told the Kansas Guard a fantastical tale. In 1916 the United States was at war with Mexican revolutionaries along the southern border. Patrick Traer told the Kansas National Guard that he was not only an orphan born in Ireland, complete with a phony Irish accent but also someone who had lost both parents to the very same revolutionaries. The story that he wove was quite the tall tale. Simultaneously earning sympathy and stoking the flames of anger against the Mexican rebels, Patrick told the Kansas Guard that his parents had gone to Mexico for a trip. While there, the Mexican rebel soldiers killed his father, and bound his mother across a cactus plant and tortured her by shaking the plant until she died from the wounds received. Patrick said he craved revenge against the Mexicans for what they did to his parents. With no parents to allow for his enlistment, a Kansas National Guard officer, Frank Brinkman, became Patrick's legal guardian so that he could join them. Little did Mr. Brinkman know, nor Judge Hall who granted the guardianship, that Patrick Traer was born in the United States and had a father who was alive and well in the very same state. Patrick had, 
in fact lost his mother, but it happened the previous year from an illness she had been battling for quite some time. Now a Kansas National Guardsman with Company C, Patrick Traer went to Fort Riley, yes, Riley, before being deployed to the Rio Grande. As with many 16-year-old kids, the reality of an adventure was quite different from the fantasy Patrick built up in his head. The Kansas officers took issue with the young Patrick's disdain for menial tasks such as chopping wood, carrying supplies, and being on guard duty. Having had a childhood of games, birthday parties, and enjoyable little summer jobs, Patrick wasn't in tune with the rugged men who populated Company C's ranks. Neither was he in tune with the adage when told by a fellow guardsman that he was a hardhead. Patrick comically challenged the man to see who really had the hardest head. They ran at each other like a pair of headbutting rams. No surprise that young Patrick's only reward was a large gash above his eye. While I am sure the injury led to quite the commotion of laughter among his comrades, more fantastical tales would spearhead the injury into the newspapers. Kansas soldier shot, Mexican shoots U.S. soldier, soldier near death. Such were the headlines in dozens of newspapers across Kansas, Iowa, Oklahoma, and elsewhere. They all spoke of the heroic and narrow escape of young Patrick Traer from the gunfire of the enemy. The imaginative Patrick seemed to want to tell his friends back home in Leavenworth of his adventures along the southern border. As chopping wood for campfires was not an exciting story, Patrick turned his silly game of headbutting into a harrowing tale. Patrick told them he had been swimming in the Rio Grande when the enemy suddenly opened fire. The Mexican sniper hit their target, shooting Traer in the head. The so-called soft-nosed bullet sheared off his skull and lodged in his jaw. The bullet knocked him unconscious, but a fellow soldier saved him from drowning. That fairy tale bullet earned Patrick the nickname, Hero of the Soft-Nosed Bullet. Once this tall tale circled back to Traer's commanders, they were less than pleased, and they had to put water on the fiery story making its way across the nation. Patrick ended up back in his hometown of Leavenworth, not as a hero but as the brunt of a joke. For several months from 1916 and into 1917, his name appeared in local papers, paired with tongue-in-cheek references to his tall tale, such as deeming his muffins from a cooking competition as potentially fatal bullets. One would think after such humiliating publicity, Patrick would lie low. But instead, he was out to redeem himself. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I, and Patrick was still eager to join the military. However, whether it be that his father still refused to sign off for his son to fight, or that the newspapers deemed Patrick a deserter from the Kansas National Guard, he had to look outside of the United States. Still only 17 years old, Patrick managed to lie his way into the Canadian military in August, as Canada was also involved in World War I. Keeping to his previous lie, Patrick told the Canadians that he was born in Dublin, Ireland, but embellished even more this time. Patrick changed his birth year to 1898 to make himself 19. Despite being a high school student, he listed himself as a medical student. Patrick hid his previous shenanigans stating that he had no previous military service. And this time, his name wasn't Patrick Traer, but instead told them he was Patrick O'Reilly. Thankfully for us, he made the mistake of listing his sister Mary Traer of Leavenworth, who was Mrs. Mary Ledger at the time, as his next of kin. Believing his lies, the reborn Patrick was granted enlistment into the Canadian Expeditionary Force and given the military identification number 3030018. With the war raging and millions of people perishing, Patrick's unit, which was coincidentally named the Princess Pats, was sent off to Europe. His experiences overseas are a tangled web all of their own, with potential lies and half-truths abounding. It is enough, for now, to say that he was in and out of hospitals for epilepsy for most of his tour of duty. There are many official documents about his hospital stays, 
including how he was pretty distraught over the death of his parents at the hands of the Mexican rebels. He just couldn't let go of his horrid made-up memories. While there is no official evidence for it, the American newspapers told of Patrick, as Patrick Traer, as having been gassed by the Germans and wounded in the jaw by shrapnel. Interesting that it speaks of a jaw injury just as with the soft-nosed bullet. Patrick was indeed on the front lines for a time in France, but virtually all of his medical records document epilepsy, scabies, and other illnesses. There was speculation on the part of a few doctors that he was suffering from shell shock, but there is no record of him having been gassed nor wounded in battle. The papers got wind of his supposed war injuries thanks to his sister Mary, with whom he wrote. Mary must have known of his lies, seeming that the letters would have been from Patrick O'Reilly and not from the name her brother grew up with, Patrick Traer. In May 1919, Patrick as Patrick O'Reilly was discharged from the Canadian military as medically unfit due to his supposed epileptic fits. No longer in the care of the Canadian Armed Services, he sought to return to his home country. But Patrick didn't want to return as Patrick soft nose Traer. No, he wanted to return as the renewed Patrick O'Reilly. For this, he would turn to his other sister, Frances, who was now Mrs. Frances Marseilles and was living in Los Angeles, California. In June of 1920, Frances Marseilles attested on a U.S. shipping board affidavit that her brother, Patrick O'Reilly, had lost his birth certificate. While accurately affirming that she was Patrick's sister and that he was a U.S. citizen born in Kansas on March 17, she lied on his behalf, saying that his last name was O'Reilly and that he was born a year earlier in 1899. Using this illegally obtained affidavit, Patrick received legal identification at the Port of San Francisco just 27 days later under the name of Patrick O'Reilly. The only identifying mark mentioned on the new ID was that he had a scar on the left of his jaw. Where this scar actually came from is a mystery all on its own. Now comes the question of how we know that this specific Patrick O'Reilly and his colorful past is the same Dr. Patrick O'Reilly who was a suspect in the murder of Elizabeth Short. Patrick O'Reilly isn't exactly a rare name after all. I could point to known photos of Dr. O'Reilly and say he has a pronounced scar on his left jaw. But I am sure many people who were involved in World War I, of which Dr. O'Reilly was admittedly one, had received facial injuries. We need something concrete that ties these two O'Reillys together beyond any reasonable doubt. And thankfully, we have just that. Going back to the beginning of this video, Lt. Frank Jemison had listed the known address of each suspect on his list. The address paired with Dr. O'Reilly was 712 South Pacific. This address was the address of his hospital in Glendale, a suburb of Los Angeles. In 1942 Dr. O'Reilly had to have a U.S. military registration card filled out. In addition to listing his address as 712 South Pacific in Glendale, he recorded his place of birth as Leavenworth, Kansas, and his date of birth as March 17, 1900. In addition, the card listed identification marks. And these were a scar on the left of his jaw and a scar on his right eyebrow. The latter would bring one's mind back to the soft-nosed bullet, aka the little headbutt incident. But this is different from the document that seals the deal. The Canadian military would send out small documents to veterans noting their service dates, unit, theater of war, etc. Having been in the Canadian military, Patrick Traer as Patrick O'Reilly would have been sent one, and indeed he was. Remember that every soldier received a special number which was unique to them, and Patrick's was 3030018. Among all of the Canadian military documents for number 3030018 is a copy of the small document sent out to Patrick O'Reilly with that exact number written on it. It lists his unit as the Princess Pats. It lists the theater of war as France. But it is the following detail which is the most important piece. Latest address. 712 South Pacific Avenue Glendale, California, USA. 
without a shadow of a doubt, Patrick O'Reilly, number 3030018, hero of the soft-nosed bullet, brother of Mary Ledger Trare, brother of Francis Marseilles Trare, son of Peter Domingo Trare, was the same Dr. Patrick S. O'Reilly who worked at 712 South Pacific Avenue, and was the suspect in the killing of Elizabeth Short. Now that I have shown that Dr. Patrick O'Reilly and Patrick Trare are the same, I can offer you why Dr. O'Reilly is a much more credible suspect than initially meets the eye. There is much more to O'Reilly's story than has just been shown and connections that have thus far been overlooked. Let us next explore one of the reasons Dr. O'Reilly made it onto Lt. Jemison's list of suspects. The assault of his secretary. In May 1939, the Black Dahlia suspect, Dr. Patrick O'Reilly, was accused of sadistically attacking his phone secretary Walling Jane McCarthy in his home. When Dr. O'Reilly was on trial for the assault in September of the same year, he dramatically defended himself by bearing his chest and displaying his leg to assert that he received wounds in World War I, which would have prevented him from dragging and attacking the 21-year-old Miss McCarthy in the ways she claimed. Papers said that Dr. O'Reilly was 41 at the time, but he was actually 39. Although Dr. O'Reilly was eventually found guilty of attacking Miss McCarthy, was he indeed crippled by the ravages of war? If he could not drag and savagely beat a woman, then it would be difficult to suggest that he was responsible for another crime involving dragging and beating. To answer this question, we must first go back 17 years to 1922, four years after the end of World War I. In August 1922, a superhuman feat hit the Los Angeles papers. The teenage daughter of a wealthy steelman, Miss May Orr, was alone in a rowboat near Balboa Beach that had drifted hundreds of yards offshore. Suddenly the rough seas tossed Miss Orr from the boat and into the waves. Not being an experienced swimmer and being weighed down by her dress, Miss Orr struggled to remain above the surface. Men on shore witnessed her frantic struggle for survival over 300 yards away, which is over 900 feet. Most men hesitated not seeing any chance to get to her through the crashing waves. One young mystery man was not deterred and immediately stripped off his clothes and dashed into the breaking waves. The people along the beach watched in amazement as this brave man swam towards the now exhausted Miss Orr. Not to be outdone, two other young men jumped into the sea but were soon overwhelmed by the surf and had trouble not needing rescue themselves. Just as Miss Orr, Having given up all of her strength, began to sink below the waves, the mystery man reached her and took hold of her limp body. Some expected both to sink to their deaths. Amazingly, the mystery man was able to drag the dead weight of Miss Orr, clothes and all, over 900 feet back to shore. He caught his breath as people rushed to care for the stunned girl. Like something out of a novel, the mystery man was suddenly gone. However, it wasn't long until it became known that the individual who miraculously saved Miss Orr's life was Patrick O'Reilly. He wasn't just any Patrick O'Reilly, but the very same who would become a suspect in the murder of Elizabeth Short and who claimed to be too crippled to assault Miss McCarthy. The parents of Miss Orr were, to no surprise, very grateful to Patrick for saving their daughter, gifting him an expensive platinum watch that was engraved. But being deemed a heroic swimmer wasn't enough for the habitually lying O'Reilly. As a childish game years earlier was twisted into a brush with death, Patrick would use this event to make himself Superman. Time and time again, he loved to be the center of attention in the newspapers. The original articles on Miss Orr's rescue mention Patrick O'Reilly as athletic and a great swimmer. Three days later, the papers heralded O'Reilly as a war hero. The following story presented in the Los Angeles Evening Express is so unbelievable that it shows their respect for veterans, not questioning the legitimacy of the story. But who were they to expect such grandiose lies from a war vet who just saved a girl's life? In addition, the story was backed by O'Reilly's sister Frances, 
who had no issue covering for his past lies. So we cannot wholly blame the newspaper for allowing the ensuing hilarity to reach their readers. According to the story, the 17-year-old O'Reilly got drunk one night while on the battlefield in France. He accidentally wandered across no man's land. I guess Patrick navigated the barbed wire by wobbling around intoxicated. Patrick then realized he had ended up at the German trenches instead of his own. According to Patrick, by using grenades, the startled and drunken youth killed a group of enemy soldiers. He, all alone, took a German machine gun and held his position for three days and three nights, killing countless enemies. Despite being seriously wounded, Patrick managed to hold off the German force until his unit arrived to rescue him. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, so let me show that this war story was another manufactured tall tale. First and foremost, there is no mention of this incident in any military documents relating to Patrick O'Reilly. The closest thing is an army nurse telling his sister in a letter that he has been telling the nurses many amazing stories from his time on the front. The paper claims Patrick received the British Cross for this one-man army event. The British Cross would be the Victoria Cross, awarded to 627 people for their service in the First World War. It was awarded to people serving in the British military as well as those in the Canadian, Australian, and other previous Commonwealth territories of the British Crown. Patrick O'Reilly served in the Canadian Armed Forces in France during World War I. However, not a single O'Reilly was a recipient, let alone Patrick O'Reilly. Also, among all of Patrick's Canadian military documents, there's no mention of being awarded any medal. It also claims that he was wounded a total of seven times, on at least three different occasions. Shall we revisit his military records? Okay, there is no mention of him having been wounded in battle. While the papers say he was gassed and suffering from shell shock, only the latter has any hint of validation in the dozens of documents. The only wounds Patrick O'Reilly seems to have received during his time with the Canadian military were a head injury from a wooden beam back in Canada, and a cut ear from falling down some stairs in a hospital. Not the first time Patrick turned stupid little injuries into tales of heroic feats. Quite amazingly, this supposedly mangled human being could swim almost 2,000 feet in rough waters while dragging another person for half of it. Now, let's return to what O'Reilly drew attention to in the courtroom concerning the assault of Miss McCarthy. He made a note of his crippled right leg. As I've seen swimmers with one leg or even no legs, let us momentarily say that his war wounds didn't affect his swimming capability. Thankfully for us, Patrick made the papers quite often. There is a small newspaper article from 1921, a year before the rescue of Miss Orr. It reads that Pat O'Reilly had won first place in the track meet of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. It detailed that he did the 100-yard dash in 9 and 4 fifths seconds. This Pat O'Reilly is the same one who swam the 600 yards and the same one who would later go to trial for allegedly attacking Miss McCarthy. How could someone with a crippled leg win first place in the 100-yard dash? Not only that, but another article says that his time was close to beating the world record at the time. As I am out for the truth, I will note that a supposed leg issue for O'Reilly did exist but even that will prove highly questionable. When Patrick O'Reilly was known in Kansas as Patrick Traer, newspaper articles cited that an ankle issue kept the minor Patrick out of the U.S. Army. However, we must look at the evidence because of the numerous fabrications by Patrick that somehow landed in the newspapers. When Patrick joined the Kansas National Guard after his supposed rejection by the U.S. Army, it was reported that he was in peak physical condition and was a prime specimen. When Patrick was later accepted into the Canadian Expeditionary Force, his documented physical examination did not mention any physical defect in his leg, but it did mention the mole on his back. I would say that the evidence shows that Patrick O'Reilly was neither a cripple nor a war hero. And because he didn't have a disability, 
His defense at the trial concerning Miss McCarthy was just his way of trying to sway the jury. Nothing physically stopped Dr. O'Reilly from doing everything he was accused of to Miss McCarthy in 1939. Photos presented at the trial showed that Dr. O'Reilly beat her face so severely that the swelling made her virtually unrecognizable. The physician who examined Miss McCarthy testified that she had two black eyes, her mouth swollen from bruises and abrasions, and that she also had fifty bruises on her body. As previously said, Dr. O'Reilly was found guilty of the attack, and Miss McCarthy was awarded damages. But the oddities that surround Patrick O'Reilly never seem to cease. He was not given prison time for this savage attack which the Black Dahlia investigator Frank Jemison later noted as being for no other reason than to satisfy his sexual desires without intercourse. Instead, the punishment Dr. O'Reilly received was unheard of by the papers reporting it. He was ordered to have a chaperone for ten years whenever he was around a single woman. How such a sentence might be enforced is unknown. But it wasn't effective as Dr. O'Reilly would meet a single lady and marry her just five years into his sentence. I highly doubt they didn't have private times before tying the knot. In addition, Lt. Jemison notes that O'Reilly was known to attend sex parties before 1947. It seems the sentence was merely for show and a slap on the wrist for the well-respected and well-known doctor. It cannot be said that Dr. O'Reilly lacked the physical ability to kill. But did he have the ability to pull off the unique manner in which Elizabeth Short was cut in half? Dr. Frederick D. Newbar, the medical examiner in the case of Elizabeth Short, stated that the dissection of Miss Short's body was a fine piece of surgery. At the grand jury investigation, Detective Harry Hansen believed that the killer was a medical man and a very fine surgeon. These statements are why many well-known suspects are, or were said to be, surgeons, and why several surgeons are on Lt. Jemison's suspect list. Some have said that Dr. Patrick O'Reilly was just a general practitioner. Others have said he was a surgeon, but not one of note. Let us examine the evidence concerning Dr. O'Reilly's profession and abilities. Based on Dr. O'Reilly's letters home while overseas during World War I, Patrick had long wanted to be a surgeon. And after the war, he realized that dream, graduating from the orthopedic college in Southern California as an orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeons are those who specialize in the musculoskeletal system, the bones, joints, ligaments, tendons, and muscles. O'Reilly quickly found employment at a Los Angeles hospital, and before long, Dr. O'Reilly was head of his own emergency hospital in Glendale. Time and time again, one will find Dr. O'Reilly in Los Angeles newspapers for being involved with the medical treatment of famous boxers, downed pilots, Hollywood stars, and even shot-up bank robbers. Pulling a bullet out of a gangster's arm doesn't precisely make O'Reilly a medical rock star. But an event in 1934, still at the young age of 34, does showcase his medical prowess. The newspaper read that it was one of the most amazing operations ever performed. Dr. Patrick O'Reilly had literally created a new muscular system along the rib cage of a famous actress, Lucille Laverne. Close to death, the operation led by Dr. O'Reilly saved her life. The procedure was a complex muscle reconstruction that required medical knowledge of the muscles, bones, organs, tendons, etc., in addition to needing the skill to pull it off successfully. Lucille Laverne's surgery was a success and she went on to live 11 more years before succumbing to an unrelated ailment. Laverne is best known for the voice of the evil queen and her alter ego The Witch, from Disney's 1937 Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Those voiceovers would never have happened if it wasn't for Dr. O'Reilly's expertise three years prior. Evidence for Dr. O'Reilly's high standing as an expert surgeon goes further. Not only was he the chief surgeon at the Glendale Emergency Hospital, later called the P.S. O'Reilly Emergency Hospital, but he was also selected as a speaker at osteopathic conventions. 
the evidence speaks for itself. Patrick O'Reilly was not just a doctor but a skilled surgeon and an expert in his field, someone who was well acquainted with the skin, muscles, tendons, bones, and organs throughout the human body. I would also like to note that while the infamous suspect George Hodel was a doctor, he was not a surgeon despite it often being said that he was. Dr. Hodel was a venereal disease physician. All which I have just laid out is not all there is to be said about Dr. O'Reilly. Rather there is much to be said about his life as Patrick Traer, as well as Patrick O'Reilly, including more hitherto unknown details which make one's eyebrow raise. The more I discovered about Dr. O'Reilly the more I saw him as a credible suspect. You can see more about these findings, as well as additional discoveries on Dr. O'Reilly and more, at BlackDahliaMystery.com. I hope to also put more of the findings into future videos. Thank you for watching. Please say a prayer for the departed Elizabeth Short and keep her memory alive.